So, in fact, his family extends quite a ways back. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, his grandfather worked on the construction of Roosevelt Dam and took some of the early photos of uh, cliff dwellings and other archaeological remains in the Tonto area. Uh, uh, if you know anything about uh, the archaeology of the transition zone of central Arizona, you don't, Scott needs absolutely no introduction. He was the forest archaeologist for the Tonto National uh, Forest for 40 years, four decades, and, and retiring in 2015. And like so many retired archaeologists, he continued doing archaeology. The only difference is he isn't paid. Uh, he, as a forest archaeologist and now as a citizen, he has done a lot with uh, the preservation and interpretation of archaeological sites and remains in the area. He has worked with volunteers. He was one of the founders of the site uh, stewards program for state parks. Uh, currently, he is uh, president of the Friends of the Tonto National Forest, has worked with other groups like the Agua Fria National Monument. So here's somebody who really knows his stuff, and it's a deep pleasure to introduce Scott. Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, <clears throat> Paul's pretty much said it said everything about me. I got four decades. It makes it sound a lot longer that way. Um, but uh, today we're gonna we're gonna take a look at a little little project I've had going up here in Payson for uh, well over a decade, uh, going on two actually, uh, to develop a site as an interpretive place uh, for the town of Payson. And you'll hear more about that in a few minutes once we get started. But uh, I'll. I know, welcome you all to uh, our little field trip of uh, Go Camp Ruin. It's a cold winter morning on Tyler Parkway here in Payson, Arizona. We're here today take a look at an all-volunteer project sponsored by the Rim Country Chapter of the Arizona Archaeological Society to excavate a uh, prehistoric Hohokam Indian run and develop it into an interpretive recreational site for the town of Payson. Let's take a walk up the trail and have a look at the place, a site we call Goat Camp Ruin. Good morning. I'm Scott Wood, retired forest archaeologist for the Tonto National Forest, and I'm here this morning to show you around Goat Camp Ruin. We're standing in the middle of a six-acre parcel that's owned by the town of Payson. Long story short, uh, the town acquired this parcel in a land exchange some years ago with the express purpose of turning it into an interpretive recreational facility. Now, not much happened for a long time uh, till the Rim Country chapter went to the town and offered to uh, implement the plan that we had created for the site. The town agreed, and since about 2008, uh, we've been working to uh, excavate, develop the site to make all that happen. Now, the site is pretty large in this six acre parcel. It covers probably two thirds to three quarters of it. And uh, it's rather complex. The area that we've been working in is mostly surface architecture off this way. Uh, but there are also a number of outlying structures. And in the area out here in front of me, probably a, uh, a fair number of buried pit houses. Now the site has a pretty long history to it. It seems to have uh, first been settled about 750-800 AD 
and appears to have been continuously occupied uh, until just about every place in the Payson area was abandoned sometime between uh, 1280 and 1300. Now we just walked up this trail. This is the Goat Camp Ruin Trail. It's part of the uh, Payson area trail system operated by the town. Uh, eventually we will have a loop trail that takes you off into the ruin itself. It'll start right about here. We'll have a nice big kiosk to introduce visitors to the site. And uh, uh, a number of interpretive signs along the way. Uh, so with that quick introduction, let's uh, take a look at the, uh, at the ruin itself. Well, we've now walked into the uh, part of the site where we've been doing most of our work. We've come down what we call Main Street. We call it that because uh, on either side of the ridge top here, uh, we have a series of individual houses that kind of make a pathway that leads down into the rest of the site. Now, most of these uh, are not going to be excavated, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, but right now, let's go down and take a look at one of the first sites, first rooms that we opened up here on the site. As I mentioned before, this is a pretty large site as a pre-classic component and a classic period component. The classic period component is pretty large. Uh, we figure there are somewhere around 30 rooms here and a number of other features. Uh, we will have uh, excavated about 10 of those. Uh, a lot of the rest of them we will leave intact as part of the interpretation of the site. But what we're in right now is uh, we call room 15. This is one of the first rooms we opened up here. And pretty typical of our detached single structure rooms out here. It's, uh, it's rectangular, has rounded corners, doorway in one of the long walls. And it's not exactly a surface structure. It's sort of dug into the hillside. The doorway here opens out on grade and then a pit was dug back into the hillside. And the way that they built the walls here was kind of interesting. Uh, in essence, the pit that they created, they faced up or lined uh, with rocks, vertical slabs and stacked rocks. And then when they got up to the ground surface, then they would build up a double row wall on top of that which seems like an efficient way to do things, except that it, it's not very strong and doesn't hold up to dead load stress that you get in the deeper parts of the pit. And this room was a good example of that. Uh, the back wall of this thing collapsed uh, at least several times, and eventually they gave up repairing it and uh, just uh, took everything out of it and then used it as a trash dump. Now, what you see here is a partially reconstructed wall. One of the, uh, one of the major aspects of this operation, everything that we excavate, we stabilize uh, to help with maintenance over the years as we want this, uh, this place to, to be relatively maintenance free for the town. Uh, but also to preserve what it is we've excavated. The floors are all covered with a geocloth and a layer of back dirt, so you won't actually be walking on the original floors. And then all the walls will be repointed or, or completely remortared uh, using a mortar that we make on site using the back dirt that came out of the rooms uh, treated with uh, soil shield. 
Now in this case, uh, we've kind of reconstructed this part of the wall mostly for maintenance purposes, uh, but uh, when we're finished with this room, we'll show that back wall as having collapsed into the room and that will be part of the interpretation. All right, with that little introduction to the architecture, let's go take a look at another one of the first rooms that we opened up. Okay, uh, this is another one of the uh, first rooms that we opened up back in 2013. Uh, similar to the last one we saw, uh, and typical of all of our detached rooms along Main Street. Rectangular rounded corners, it's kind of built into the hillside a little bit. This one uh, not so steep in the back so it didn't collapse on them. And this one was one of the few rooms that we have up here that had something of a floor assemblage. There were actually some artifacts on the floor here. The room, like most every other room up here, burned and collapsed. And we had a lot of pottery in the room, in the roof fall, apparently from pots sitting on the roof when the, when the building collapsed. Uh, the floor was terrible, uh, but we did uh, did have a little bit of a peak at a floor assemblage in here, which was turns out to be unusual for this site. Typical of, of most of these rooms, this uh, these sort of weak walls were buttressed on the outside with a line of rocks that kind of. slight pause for a hurricane here. They buttress the outsides of the walls to build up a kind of platform to support them at the base. And we've seen this at a number of these uh, standalone rooms out here. So let's go take a look at some uh, other rooms on the other side of the ridge now. All right, this is room six. We opened it up uh, some years ago. It's probably the most <clears throat> most pit house like uh, room on the site. It's basically dug into the surface of the ridge and the pit lined with these big slabs, very tall slabs. It looks very much like any sort of late pre-classic Holcom pit house you might see down in the desert foothills area. It turned out to be a very interesting room for a couple of reasons. One of which, it, it gave us some insight into their construction techniques, the idea of lining the pit and then building a wall on top of that, which turned out to be rather weak. Uh, it told us they weren't very, uh, uh, very good at sighting these things. You'll be able to notice uh, most of the, the wall in here is slab faced except on this side. It appears that this part of the room was built over some soft fill, possibly the fill of an underlying pit house, and it collapsed on them. And what they did to repair it was use an entirely different form of masonry and built up this nice stacked wall here to replace the slabs that had collapsed out uh, into the fill. It worked pretty well. This wall still kind of tilts out a bit. Uh, they did some additional buttressing around the outside of the rest of it, building a row of these granite boulders on the outside and packing in rock behind the slabs to make it more stable. So they were constantly working on these things, apparently. Again, we've got a really wide doorway. We found this to be framed up inside, wooden frame, the adobe, to make it narrower. But what was probably the most interesting part of this room is that part way down into the fill, we found a U-surface and a small hearth that we think uh, 
reflects an Apache reoccupation of the site, probably sometime in the 1600s. After finding that, uh, we started looking at the, uh, at the artifact assemblages from the sites, or from the different rooms, and discovered we had quite a bit of, of difference in at least the distribution and kinds of lithic material that we're seeing in the uppermost layers of the fill that kind of indicates we had a pretty good Apache occupation uh, after the site had been long abandoned. We've also gotten some Apache pottery out of the place and there are several uh, small roasting pits scattered around the site that we think are probably related to that occupation. Uh, those are still on the menu to do some excavation for uh, to make sure. This room, like all the others, burned and was cleaned out uh, before it was backfilled. And what we've seen is that pretty much all the rooms that we've dug, with a couple of exceptions, were deliberately backfilled before they left the site. Uh, what we've been seeing is a lot of kind of reverse stratigraphy with some of our earliest pottery, uh, Snake Town, Gila Butte, Red Arm Buff, showing up in the upper layers of the fill, uh, which kind of indicates they were backfilling these with old trash uh, left behind from the earlier pre-classic occupation of this part of the site. Let's go look at another room. This is room 22. This is one of my favorite rooms. It's very pretty. It's probably one of the best built rooms we have up here. Uh, very sturdy masonry in this one. Again, rectangular, rounded corners. Uh, the odd thing about this room is that its doorway is in the wrong wall. Normally these things, the doorways are on one of the long walls. This one's on a short wall and required a pretty steep ramp to get down into it. The doorway again was framed up. You can still see some of the uh, uh, burnt daub from the adobe covered framework on the inside of this. This room had a very, very nice, well finished floor, uh, burnt as they all were. Beautiful hearth right about in here cleaned out. Uh, in fact, pretty much all of our horrors were cleaned out before the rooms were, were backfilled and abandoned. This one was deliberately raised as well. Uh, when the site was first recorded, this room didn't show up. There were only a couple of rocks sticking up in a row over here. Traced them out and found a whole new room that we didn't know about because they had literally pushed the walls into the room and filled it full of trash to close it out before they left. All right, now we're, we're here in room seven. Room seven turned out to be one of our most interesting and most time-consuming rooms. Since we only work like every other weekend in the fall and the spring seasons, this took us several years to deal with because it turned out to be quite complicated. We called this room the Basilica. You can kind of guess it's all curved at this end and squared off at that end. Turns out that wasn't the original configuration of this room, but we'll get to that. As we opened this thing up, we started with uh, quarters and very quickly got into a very heavy layer of pottery coming down onto the, onto the floor. And long story short, once we opened this thing up, it became very clear that this room was a dedicated storehouse. Just dozens of large uh, storage vessels on the floor lining both sides of the room, sort of an aisle coming in from the doorway, 
Curiously, for a storage room, it had a hearth, which was cleaned out, as usual. And as we opened up this side of the room, we noticed there was a lot of pottery in this corner, a lot of pottery in this corner, not so much in here, but there was a lot of rock. Well, the rock turned out to be a nice, tightly clay-mortared stone platform, very similar to the granary platforms you see down in Tano Basin. This one was semi-circular and about two meters in diameter, and there was very little pottery on top of it which was a little puzzling for a while until we noticed uh, basketry impressions in the mortar holding the rocks together. So we figured this particular area was used for specifically storing stuff in baskets while the rest of it was all in jars. We got some pretty good information out of this room. Burned beans, tepary beans, burned corn, uh, uh, some little odds and ends, little uh, uh, vignettes of, of behavior in here. At some point, somebody lost a really beautiful little shell bracelet made up of little tiny glycimer shells strung together that we found here next to the hearth. Like all the other rooms, this burned, but it wasn't cleaned out. It, it burned, collapsed with all the pots in place. And we started this room off with a test unit over here in the corner. I don't know if you can see it, but that is floating on fill. And at the bottom of the, uh, of the test unit, we found another floor or with burned beams on it. So we excavated this half of the room to see what this earlier floor would have looked like. And it turns out that this room had been completely rebuilt to make it into a storeroom. It had started off as a room about the same size as 22. Uh, and this wall was not original. The original wall came out here somewhere. It was dismantled, rebuilt into this thing. Both floors used the same entryway which is centered on the wall, which you'll notice is not centered at this point. What they did was expand the room both this way and this way to turn it into a storage room, convert it from residential to storage. Our lower floor actually ended right about here. And then all we had was the upper floor and sterile fill underneath. So the, the room was considerably smaller in its original form. This one took us a while to, uh, to figure out. Uh, so we, we've got a lot to do to, to play with this one for stabilization. We'll build the uh, floor back up with fill. We're not going to expose the platform, but we'll make a reproduction of it to sit on top of the fill that we put in the room to protect the floor so people can get an idea of what that did look like. This one we're currently in the process of of doing stabilization for so these walls are done we're still working on these walls over here. This is going to take us a while. But this is one of our favorite rooms. Tons of pottery came out of this room. Uh, and it's going to be a real, real challenge to try to fit some of those together because we think we have whole pots. All right, let's take a look at the latest part of the site and the part that we're working on right now. So we'll wander off this way through what was originally the central plaza of the, of the site. Well, we've left room seven and we've walked out into what seems to be the, the central plaza. It was established when there were pit houses here uh, and it continued to be an open area throughout most of the occupation until the last phase of construction here when some of it was taken over by the buildings we're going to look at next.
All right, this is the area of the site that we're working on currently, the Room 8 complex. We'll be focusing uh, most of the rest of our excavation effort here. There'll be some smaller things to do around the site after we finish this, but this is where we're going to be for quite a while longer. Now, before I tell you about the Room 8 complex, I'd like to put in a little plug for the project itself. It is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, run by the Arizona Archaeological Society, sponsored by the Rim Country Chapter. We've got folks from a variety of different chapters that work up here on a regular basis. Rim Country, Desert Foothills, Phoenix, Santan, in fact, anybody that belongs to the Arizona Archaeological Society can come up and work with us. We've been doing, they've been doing all the field work, all the lab work. It is a completely all volunteer project. No money from the town. Uh, this has all, all been on our own so far. So, that being said, let's talk about this complex of rooms here. We call it Room 8 Complex because it's centered on this very large structure here that we call Room 8. It is the biggest single structure on the site. Uh, as you can see, it's one large contiguous room. There don't seem to be any cross walls in it. Uh, we've tested for those, we've probed for those. Can't find anything that divides it up, so it's one large room. It's also built in a different fashion than all the other rooms that we've looked at so far. This was not something that was dug into the hillside. This was built on top of the ridge. And in fact, probably intruded into what was public space in part of the plaza in the central part of the site. The walls in this thing are absolutely massive. The wall itself is like a meter wide. Some of the stones used to build it weigh upwards of, you know, two, three hundred pounds. And like most of the building stone on this site, they were brought in from half a mile to a mile away off of Houston Mesa. It's all Tapeat sandstone, which doesn't occur on this ridge. So they were transporting most of this stuff to get it in here. Now what we're doing with this room right now, we've dropped a couple of test units in it to get an idea where the floor is. And we're just sort of taking it down by quarters uh, to see what we can find in here. We have already seen that same sort of Apache lithic assemblage in the upper levels. We've got the same kind of reverse stratigraphy in the ceramics. So it does look like this room was deliberately closed and backfilled like the others. Uh, old trash being dumped in to finish filling it up. In at least this test unit, we found a burnt beam on the floor. So it was burned like the others, uh, but we'll find out more once we get farther into it. Now, what makes this a complex is that this is, this is the only area in the site that really has a, a number of contiguous rooms. This room, eight, was probably built first and then had a number of other structures attached to it on the outside. We're going to go take a look at those now, where we've done a little more work. I'm going to walk out through the massive doorway here. All right, I'm in what we're calling room 28 right now. This was the first additional structure that we think, think was built up against room eight. You can see the massive wall, the outer face of room eight here. This room was just butted up against it. It's turned out to be a very interesting room. It's very, had a very, very nice floor. Had probably one of the best floors we've seen up here. It was pretty easy to find. Uh, prepared clay floor, coved into clay plaster on the walls over here. We've got remnants of burned wall plaster all over the room. The floor was particularly easy to find because it was covered with a 
like a quarter of an inch layer of powdered charcoal which was puzzling at first until we started seeing little flecks of undamaged but charred pieces of reed so it looks like it had a reed mat carpet uh, at least on this part of the floor here it seems to have come about halfway into the floor now we originally just were going to dig this half found nothing on the floor it was cleaned out as always beautiful hearth cleaned out full of burnt beams and backfill but a couple of things piqued our interest about this room not the least of which was that our floor seemed to be diving downwards over into this corner well below the level that I'm standing on here and near the base of the wall for eight what we were finding was a cluster of pottery and in that cluster of pottery, it looked like at least one whole broken vessel, was the remains of a very nice but burned Olivella necklace. About 40 different little shell beads attached to that. The back wall also collapsed back in there, and we'll take a closer look at it in a bit, but the wall of eight seems to have sunk into the ground on this side and we've got a similar problem on the wall on this side and I think what was going on is they built this thing over some earlier structures possibly a pit house which is what those and beads could be related to maybe another pit house over here or a pit of some kind and the wall collapsed into it we'll take a look at, at the effects of that here but this is, a, this is a pretty important room, and, and it's the only one we've seen that, that was almost fully plastered on the inside, at least from the burnt daub that we've gotten out of it. But as for what it was for, again, hard to tell because there was nothing on the floor. We did, however, as we got into the side of the room, find a lot more burned roofing material and stacks of broken storage vessels that had been sitting on the roof and collapsed into the room in the in the roof fall above the floor um, situation kind of similar to what we had back in room one uh, but a lot of material made it kind of difficult to, to work our way down to the floor so we've still got some work to do in this room we're still trying to figure out how this relates to the original ground surface on the outside but I think this room gives us a little bit of an indication of, of how the earlier part of the site may have been laid out around the plaza with pit houses probably up in this area that they built over the top of and the walls sinking into it. Now the second thing that was built up against room 8 is this feature right here, feature 29. The surface in here is actually lower than the, the floor in this room. There's sort of a subtle ramp taking you out of the doorway into here. This appears to have been a courtyard, unroofed. Um, lots of charcoal, burned beams and stuff in the room here. Out here, no charcoal, just little splashes of fully consumed ash. So this thing was not roofed. This was open. It also doesn't have a real floor. It's mostly just a surface uh, that was very difficult to, to trace in here. Now the purpose of this feature, this courtyard, seems to be uh, specifically to control access into this room and the big room. To get into either one of those, you have to come through this entrance into this courtyard before you can enter either one of those rooms. Now for some reason when they built this they offset the wall. Not sure why other than that, that was a beautiful corner there and they were probably showing it off. But this courtyard 
tells us that there was something very special going on with these rooms that they had to have access controlled to get into them. Now after this was built, you can see another courtyard off there. That's been real puzzling. We're, we're still working on that one. Again, it has a terrible floor or surface in it that's being very difficult to find. And it seems to have no entryway, which was kind of puzzling. Until we opened, opened it up on this side, found a gap in the masonry wall and a doorway that leads off into another feature over there which is possibly the most puzzling one we've had out here because it, it looks like a room. It's got burnt plaster on the walls, it's got burnt beams, it's got burnt posts sticking up out of the floor, but the wall doesn't continue around the whole thing. It, we can't find all the walls to it. So we're working on that. We'll see what it turns into. But it may be another room. And if it is, then we have a room that accesses the courtyard, but neither one of those has access to the outside. So it's a little puzzling at this point. So like I said, this is, this is the focus of our effort right now. Uh, this is also going to be one of the hardest things we'll have to do for stabilization. We are talking massive rocks in here, some structural problems we're going to have to deal with to keep this thing intact, um, but a lot of anticipation for what this roommate is going to turn into. But we do think this is, uh, this is an important part of the site. It appears to be the latest part of the site. It intrudes into what was probably public space before. Uh, so we're really looking forward to seeing what's in it. So what have we learned here at Go Camp Ruin? We're still waiting on our C14 dates. We've been trying to accumulate money for that, but we've got a pretty good idea of the time span that this, this site represents. It seems to be one of the earlier Holocom settlements in the Payson area. And if we're seeing it correctly, it was at one time probably the largest uh, pre-classic Holocom site in this area. It was fairly well off, at least in the early years. We've got a lot of decorated pottery that ties back to the pre-classic part of it that we keep seeing in the backfilled trash. About 70% of what we're seeing is, is Holocom buffwares coming out of the valley. By the classic period, however, the site seems to have shrunk down to just this part of the ridge. Um, whether that represents a, a reduction in population, we don't know yet. Uh, but certainly a, a, a transformation of the site and how it was operating. Unfortunately, what was going on in here has been difficult because the rooms were all cleaned out uh, before they were abandoned. We have got uh, some good information on subsistence and things. We do have burned beans, burned corn. We've got a number of mescal knives, so we figure they're, they're working uh, agave up here as well. A lot of deer bone, um, so it's a picture that fits in with what else we know about the Payson area and how people were living up here. But what exactly happened to the to the site, we're not we're not entirely sure. Um, the room eight complex is kind of unique up here. There is nothing else really comparable to it, um, but it didn't last very long. There is a much larger site up on the ridge behind me here uh, that's now completely covered with uh, houses uh, where these folks probably ended up at some point. Uh, they appear to have taken over trade for the area. That site, Rissa Ranch Ruin, 
uh, has a lot of classic period trade material, uh, pottery from all over the place, a copper bell. Um, so whatever the importance this site had during the pre-classic, it seems to have lost some of that during the classic period. But even so, it is about the fourth largest site in the Payson Star Valley area. Once we finish the excavation, it's actually when the real work starts, because we're gonna have to be uh, fixing the rooms up to be durable enough to be relatively maintenance-free as an interpretive site. So a lot of stabilization, uh, a lot of moving of dirt. We will be partially backfilling the rooms as well uh, to keep those floors protected. Moving a lot of this rock, uh, some of it will go into trail construction for the interpretation. A lot of it we're going to end up using as erosion control uh, on the ridge as there are a number of gullies that have developed along the sides of the ridge over the years. Um, and then there's signage and brochures and, and all of that stuff uh, that will come into building an interpretive site in the future. And what we hope to do with this for the town of Payson is kind of make this a hub uh, for, for archaeological interpretation out here. The Forest Service has an interpreted site up on Houston Mesa a couple miles that way called Shoefly Village. Um, there have been a lot of work done in the area for all the land exchanges and we kind of hope to, to tell a little bit of the story of all of these sites here uh, in town so that people will get a chance to experience all of what was going on in the archaeology of Payson. Uh, as part of their their recreational experience in the town of Payson. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, appreciate your interest in this site. And uh, boy, if you belong to AAS, give me a holler. Come up and join us. Well, Scott, that was great. What a project. <laughs> uh, you've got a lot of work done and a lot to do still. So that's that's pretty awesome. Yeah, there, there is still an awful lot to do up there. Uh, yeah. the, the excavation, just the, you know, the fun part of it, uh, developing the site is going to be the real, the real issue. Right. So we have some questions. So let me look at what we've got here. Um, what are the implications or interpretations of the closings of the rooms, cleaning out the hearth, pushing in the walls, filling with trash, et cetera? Can you talk about that? It's, it's hard to say. Uh, a lot of different folks around the world have a tendency to finish off a site when they leave it. Um, it's not a real strong uh, tradition uh, in the Payson area. Uh, or anywhere in central Arizona. In fact, I don't know of any other site that's, that was so deliberately closed out as this one. And it may have something to do with the unique aspect of what room eight represents. Uh, hopefully we'll find out a little more once we can open that thing up. But um, it is clear that it was an intentional closure of, of the site. And at this point, you know, we're going to try to figure that out. Right. And were all the rooms, did all the rooms show that? Um, not exactly. Uh, room one uh, did burn and collapse while it was in use, kind of, we think. Um, so it may have gone out early. And then uh, 
room seven uh, was not closed out. It just burned and fell in on top of all those pots. And uh, we just don't see exactly the same sequence of filling. I think it was filled after it collapsed, but I don't think that it was done in the same deliberate manner as the rest of them. But everything else, yeah, they, uh, they went to great lengths to, uh, to uh, fill them back up. And for room 22, I, I mean, they made it disappear. Uh, so it's, it's unusual and frustrating because it makes it hard to figure out what that was. <laughs> Yeah, so there's a related question. Um, any ideas why they would clean out all of those rooms, but not the storeroom? No, uh, other than the fact that uh, that thing may have burned and collapsed, and maybe that was a, a trigger. Maybe that was the last straw. I said, okay, that's it. We're out of here. We just lost all of our stuff in the storeroom. Uh, let's let's move down into Tama Basin and live along the river. I don't know. Right. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, Ev, was the hearth in room seven part of the earlier residence, or was it installed as part of that storage room? Excuse me. Could you... uh, the hearth in room seven was there? Yeah. Was it was it part of the earlier uh, there actually, structure? There are actually two hearths. One on the lower floor and one on the upper floor. They were practically right on top of each other, which was kind of interesting. Um, unfortunately, both of them were cleaned out. Um, so it had a hearth as it's as a little residential room, but it also had one as a storeroom, which was really odd. Um, let's see, any evidence of ball courts or platform mounds or that kind of thing? No, no, nothing in the basin area. Uh, did you get any dendro dates from all of that burned wood? Uh, no. Um, most of what we've been able to get out there has been pretty heavily fragmented. Even the, the beams that we've gotten uh, just kind of fall apart as they're coming out as much as we've tried to keep them intact. Uh, we do have a couple of pieces that we might be able to use, but given their condition, I think we're only getting the very inner parts of, of the beams. Uh, so we'll see. At, at the moment, our, our go-to dating process is gonna be C14, because we have a ton of that. We've got more charcoal than I know what to do with. <laughs> and do you have plans to excavate down into the pit house area at all, or have you done any of that? Uh, no, we would love to, uh, but Unfortunately, the plan that we're working under uh, and the one that's been consulted on uh, is pretty limited to just the surface structures in that one portion of the site. If I were to get really ambitious and somehow be able to go back in time 20 years, uh, I might think about you know, trying to modify that plan and, and work something out. But for the moment, that's going to have to lie sometime in the future with somebody else to deal with it. Got enough to do, it seems like. <laughs> um, what were the upper walls and roofs like? There's a couple of questions related to this. Will the interpretive site include reconstructed upper walls and roofs at all? Uh, no, uh, that sort of thing we'll do in the interpretation. You know, we'll have drawings of what the things would have looked like. Uh, but basically, we're not going to do any real reconstruction. We will stabilize them up to uh, ground level. Uh, we will probably add uh, a couple of courses on top of that uh, just to make sure that it stays above ground level mm -hmm. um, and doesn't fill in over the top of it. Uh, but no, we don't plan to, uh, to do anything like that. Uh, keeping the site as low maintenance as we can is a big part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same, same sort of process that we used uh, at Shoefly and down at Sears K Ruin down by Carefree. Um, you know, he, he, anytime you get to deal with something like this, um, especially with, a, with the town, which doesn't have a lot of resources, uh, you, you wanna keep it simple, sturdy, 
uh, and self-maintaining as much as possible. Right. And, and as authentic as you found it. That's where right. leaving a lot of it unexcavated. Um, we'll clear some of those rooms uh, of vegetation, uh, you know, maybe clear the walls a little bit just so that you can see them a little better. Uh, but we want to keep that sort of as found uh, condition. Uh, when you take the tray, the loot trail to walk in there, the first rooms you're going to see uh, will be unexcavated. So people will get a chance to, to get a feel for what the site looked like before we opened it up. Mm, good. Yeah, what a, a related question to the roof. Um, I don't think you mentioned what the roof material was made out of. Uh, mostly what we're seeing in the beams is um, pine or pinion. Um, some pretty substantial beams in most cases. Uh, we think the walls were full height masonry, which was a little surprising when we first opened the place up. It's kind of unusual for the area. Um, the roofs uh, were apparently quite substantial. Uh, the amount of roof fall, burned roof fall that we get in some of these rooms is, is amazing. Um, so they were well built up rooms. I mean, it gets cold and pace in there and it rains. So you want to have a pretty substantial roof. Okay. Um, how Now this is about the tepary beans. Um, were they native to that area or were they harvested from some other area? And would they have been tended or managed in some way? Oh, I think they were grown as well. No, yeah, they're not native to the area, uh, but they're a you know, standard, uh, standard product of Hoakam agriculture. Um, so yeah, I think they're brought up there as part of the the regular constellation of of species that folks were planting up there and managed to grow up in the basin area mm -hmm. and it sounded like you had corn and agave as well that yeah were not attending. direct evidence of agave um but we haven't we haven't done the floats yet so we may get some of that uh, but a lot of indirect evidence in the in the form of uh, mescal knives, some of which are made out of material that came from a long way away from there. We've got some that appear to be made out of the same kind of rhyolite that we find out on Perry Mason. So mm. we're importing a lot of a lot of lithic material up there. Although most of our lithic stuff is very, very local. I mean, there is uh, outcrops of, of chalcedony that we call the rim gravels up there that just go on for acres and acres. Uh, so that kind of stuff is the bulk of our lithic assembly. It's, it's the most you know, expedient lithic assemblage I've ever seen. Uh, there's so much of it around. You just pick up a rock, whack off a nice sharp edge, use it till you're through with it, throw it away, get a new one. Because uh, you don't have to go anywhere to, to find it. But we do get some exotic materials, especially um, out of the early trash. Um, a lot of our uh, monos that are coming out with the early trash are a nice black vesicular basalt. It looks like the stuff that comes out of uh, North Scottsdale. Uh, most of our later stuff is local uh, out of the granite that actually outcrops on the ridge and out of the Tapit sandstone that comes from nearby. Um, a lot of our, our uh, monos and stuff uh, seem to be made out of a particular kind of medium grain basalt that we know comes from about 10 or 12 miles away. Uh, there's an there's a interesting mix of, of very, very local stuff and some uh, you know, long distance imported material as well. And yet it seems they had to pull those, bring those boulders in from a long way away, right? It's a good mile or, or two to get those. And some of those things are enormous, you know, yeah. 70, 80 centimeters across, you know, 10 to, to 15 centimeters thick. Uh, I mean, they, they are enormous. Uh, I've never seen anything built out of rock that massive in the basin area. 
Okay, what are the intrusive ceramics of the classic period in this area? Uh, mostly what we get is uh, uh, little Colorado white wares, a uh, little bit of Tucson, um, and the odd piece of Cibola. Uh, not much of anything else. I think we've had one or two pieces of uh, early White Mountain redware, uh, and, and that's about it. Uh, we seem to get a lot more uh, out of the pre-classic associated trash, a lot more Tucson, a lot of Tucson in Little Colorado. And like I said in the video, a, a ton of bufflers. Uh, I mean, it's not, it's, you know, one or two percent of the overall assemblage, but most of what we get is, is buffler. All right. Um, so is the site open to the public now? Oh yeah, it, okay. it, it's not advertised or anything. Uh, oh, the sign at the trailhead says "Go Camper Trail," um, but it's uh, yeah, it's it's open to the public. It's on town property. Uh, anybody can go there. Uh, we get visitors all the time when we're working. Um, it's it's kind of a good thing because a lot of the locals that live around there uh, hike that trail, and they they tend to keep an eye on the place for us. So, okay. but yeah, anybody can come visit. Yeah, and that was that was the the last question that we had. What's the plan for protection of the site and the area from vandalism, and then opening it up? When when will it be? The, when will it be interpreted and ready for us to understand it <laughs> that way? <laughs> it's probably a good five years away. Okay. We'll get to that. Uh, we still got a lot of logistics to work out. We're trying to get some help from the town. Um, there's a lot of rock to move. Um, just cleaning up the site after excavation uh, is, is going to be a big thing. And then we got to find the money for the interpretation and, and, and all of that. So it's, it's going to be a little, a little while. Um, but in terms of protection, the, the town actually... Uh, has created an ordinance to protect the site. Um, so you're breaking town law if you go out there and mess with it. Um, so it, it can be patrolled by the town police. Uh, we're going to work on uh, a site steward agreement with the town uh, so that uh, we can get an official site steward presence out there. Right now it's pretty informal. Uh, a lot of our crew is local and people keep an eye on it. So we're not too worried about it right now, but long-term we would like to get a, a site steward agreement for the, for the place. Great, great. Uh, there was, there is one other question. What's the largest site in the Payson area is, or Payson uh, Star V area? What is? Um, the biggest one out there was Rissa Ranch Room, uh, which sits about a mile away from Go Camp uh, up on the top of the hill and the Alpine Heights uh, housing area. When it was finally recorded uh, in the 70s, uh, building had already started up in there. Uh, and at that point, there were still 50 rooms. Um, you can still see the bits of outlying rooms in people's yards as you walk around the area. Uh, at its height, there may have been uh, 70, 80, 90 rooms up in there all together. Um, some of the, the old timers have always said, oh yeah, it was 100 rooms. We don't know, but it was quite, quite large before it ended up getting destroyed. Uh, there was some work done up there. Uh, Scottsdale Community College was up there, some work by SU and uh, a little bit of work with um, um, the Room Country chapter. Uh, and at the moment, all that's left of it is one house lot, uh, which was actually purchased some 20 years ago by the Northern Gila County Historical Society. And what's in there now uh, was excavated and is maintained by Room Country chapter. Next biggest site in the Payson area is Shufla, uh, which something on the order of 80, 85 rooms. Uh, and from there you go, you go down from there, the next biggest one runs about 40. Uh, so 
uh, go camp is right up there. Uh, big sites are not common in the Payson area. It's mostly small stuff uh, scattered around um, with, a, with a handful of big sites that kind of anchor this rural population around it. Um, I, I have a question, uh, Marilyn. Can you put your shell question in there again? I don't see it in the list. I have a question from Marilyn um, Gita asking about a shell question, but I don't have it in here. So you could type it in again, Marilyn, I'll, or I'll get it. Maybe, up, oh, here we go, maybe. Well, here's, oh, here's, a, here's a, here it is. Can you provide any rever reference or authors who've published on shell trade? I'm fascinated by Pacific Coast shell in ancient Southwest sites. Uh, uh... I'm not much of a shell specialist. Uh, uh, we have some people that that are kind of involved in the project that will handle it for us. Uh, I'm not the one to ask that question, to answer that question. Okay, and I'm not sure if that was Marilyn's question or not, but I see it here, so uh, get, that, go ahead. A lot of shell, at least out of the early trash. Uh, Glycemerous uh, bracelet fragments are pretty common and, and Pendants and the uh, oh the uh, the little uh, uh, olivella beads that we've been getting out of room twenty eight. The necklaces we've been working more in the north part of that room, and there's a huge badger burrow in the middle of it, of course. <laughs> uh, and finding more and more of these things scattered around. I think we're up to like sixty or seventy of them now. Uh, so there's a, there's a fair amount of those, but yeah, it's, it's, there's some shell. It seems to drop off though in the in the the later periods, at least the later trash that we're seeing from the lower parts of the room. We don't see so much. Okay, so if there's anyone in attendance who has a reference for authors who have published on the shell trade, you could put that in the chat, and I will make sure Marilyn gets that, or other folks get it. Uh, I think that's all we have for questions right now. Yep, looks like that's it. Um, thank you so much, Scott, for taking us Saturday, Sunday afternoon <laughs> to meet with us. Mm -hmm. And thank you to everyone else who was out there today for joining us. Uh, this video will be, the video tour will be published on our um, Ark and Hiss YouTube channel. So if you'd like to watch it again or show it to someone else, it will be there. Um, and yeah, thank you, Scott, and, and have a good afternoon and the rest of your weekend, which is not too much longer. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of thank yous in the chat, and I will, I will forward those to you, Scott. Okay, and okay. thanks everybody for, for coming to see our site, and you're always welcome to come visit it in person, too. Um, Great, thank you, and have a good day, everyone.